and welcome to this month's uh, Positive Economics webinar. Really delighted to see so many of you have come back uh, and based on the great attendance that we had last month as well. So my name is Susan Hayes Culleton. I am the, one of the co-authors of Positive Economics and uh, this webinar is dedicated to the students and teachers of Leaving Cert Economics, but I'm well aware that there are a wide range of people who have chosen to join us this evening because they are simply interested in the subject. So to you all, you're super, 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 super welcome. Now, tonight what we're going to talk about is we're going to put the spotlight on entrepreneurship and we're going to particularly take a look at it in the context of how people feel about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. I just want to, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts and what you think the connotations are of entrepreneurship, etc. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the relationship between entrepreneurship and, and employment. And we're also going to have a look at the government supports for entrepreneurship and just get a bit of an understanding as to why they're there. Then after that, I'm also going to take you through the latest uh, economic output when it comes to COVID-19. And then um, throughout as well, I'm going to take you through a research study structure. Now, just to give the context to people who haven't been on this webinar before, Last month, when we met digitally, when we met, uh, the schools weren't long closed. Uh, there was a, la a, a serious lack of clarity around all things, not just to do with school, but to do with the, the, um, with the, the Leaving Cert as well. At that stage as well, there was just very recent announcements around the COVID pandemic payment. It had just been increased up to €350 Euro, and the wage subsidy scheme was put in place. And that is where if a company has... Uh, suffered a decrease of 25% of their sales, they could apply to the government to pay 70% of their staff's wages. And then the companies were, um, they were encouraged then to top up those payments so that they could continue to employ people. Now, some of those people would remain in actually working in the business, and then other people would have been not working in the business uh, for particularly in places, let's say it was like retail or hospitality where they couldn't. So I just wanted to, to set the scene really tonight to say that that's where we were. And we're now, of course, a month later. Uh, any of you just watching the news there a while ago, you'll have, no, you'll have now seen that RTE is now applying for the wage subsidy scheme for its staff. Uh, and RTE is one of 40,000 employers that has applied for it. And you may also be aware that 255,000 staff in the country, 255,000 people are on the wage subsidy scheme. Now, to put that in context for you, right, the largest number of people in employment in the history of the state were employed in February of 2020, and that was 2.3 million people. Now, 255,000 of those people, nearly, um, nearly 10%, in fact, over 10%, of those people are now on the wage subsidy scheme. So the way in which the government interacts with businesses has never been more relevant than, than right now. Never, ever, ever been more relevant. Now, uh, one of the things that I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to take you through why businesses close, right? And we'll do that, we'll do that much later on. But before I get to that, I would just I'd really like to hear your thoughts on this, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a poll and I'm going to ask you to give me your thoughts, okay? And, and I'll, I'll reflect back your answers to you and then I'll give you I'll gi give you the answers then. So, so here's the poll. And the question I want to ask is, do you think the main reason that businesses close, is it because they don't make enough profit? Is it because they can find a better, uh, uh, a better opportunity somewhere else? Is it because of family reasons or is it because they can't get access to money, right? So um, at this stage, 4% uh, of you have voted. Uh, now we're, um, I'm just going to give you, we're now 32 seconds in. So 11% of you voted. I'm just, just going to give this another couple of moments. Um, really interesting. And, and by the way, what you're, what you're telling me is what I expected you to tell me. And so what I'm going to do is at the end of a minute, I'm going to show you what you said. And then towards the end of the session tonight, I'm going to tell you what the real answer is by virtue of the, by virtue of the, the data. Okay. Um, okay. So do you think... Do you think the main reason that businesses close is it because they don't make enough profit? Is it because they can't they can find a better opportunity somewhere else? Is it due to family reasons, or is it because uh, because people have issues getting money? Okay, so now we're a minute and uh, twenty seconds in. I'm just going to stop there now. Uh, I'm going to close the poll, 
and I'm going to show you what you said. Okay. So what you said is this: 37% uh, of you said because they're not making enough profit. 35% of you said because they can find a better opportunity elsewhere. Um. Hello, everybody, and welcome, very, very welcome to each and every one of you this evening. I'm really delighted uh, that that you can join us right here and uh, right here for the Positive Economics webcast. My name is Susan Hayes Cullerton, and just before we started, I had put out a question to you, which is, what do you think the main reason that businesses uh, that businesses close are? And of course, you have you have shared your insights with me there, and I have just shown you what you've said. I will check in with you later on and I'm going to show you what the answer actually is based on the Irish data but I just thought it might be an interesting uh, interesting way way to start so thank you very much to, to every one of you that uh, that that shared your insights on that so my name is Susan Hayes Culleton and I am the co-author of Positive Economics and of course Positive Economics is the economics textbook for Leaving Cert in Ireland and that is who this webinar is dedicated to. I am here to help all of you, uh, those students and teachers of the subject, to let you know some updates about what is what is going on within the environment. And uh, we're going to talk through a range of range of different things this evening. Um, also, there's a lot of people here tonight who have not been on this webinar before. Uh, you may not be teachers, you may not be students, uh, you may simply have an interest in the subject and you are super super welcome as well i just like to briefly set the scene for you and that is that the last time i spoke to you the last time i spoke to you we had had a couple of announcements we were told that the wage subsidy scheme for example that that was going to take place and that was where the government was going to provide up to 70 percent of a person's wage in a company where by the company had it suffered a 25 percent or more decreased in sales. In other words, their sales fell by a quarter. And what I'm really struck by was, I don't know if, if how many of you saw the news this evening, but uh, RTE is now applying for that. So the, the national state broadcaster is now applying for the wage subsidy scheme. We also know that uh, 40,000 other businesses have applied for the scheme. And we also know that 255,000 workers are now availing of the wage subsidy scheme. So that's where we were a month ago. And at the time, things were, you know, we were waiting for things to, be, to become clear and so on like that. And uh, now a month on, you can just see just how many people have now, have now tapped into that. And um, also, of course, there was a lot less clarity around the Leaving Cert. Uh, a number of you were asking me about, about that the last time. And we also hadn't entered um, the, the full on lockdown as we had. Now the schools had closed all right. So what I'm going to do this evening is that I am going to take you through the spotlight in entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is one of, or enterprise itself is one of the factors of production. It is hugely important in the Irish economy. I'm going to give you the, the data on that. And as the reason that I started off by mentioning the wage subsidy scheme is business is so important in the context of employment, employment in Ireland is that the government were willing to do what they've done in this case because it just meant that it was of such, such huge importance. So if there was ever a time that was right to talk about Irish entrepreneurship and the impact of, of enterprise and employment and, and the government, it is now, it is absolutely now for sure. Uh, and then what I'm also going to do is uh, at a later, later part of the session, I'm going to take you through uh, the update on the economic impact of COVID-19, not in employment only, but on the economy broadly. And then what we're going to do is we're also going to talk through the research study structure as well. So for any of you who are in fifth year and joining joining me this evening, you will have to put together a research report uh, later on this year uh, during your first term back in school. You will be putting together this and uh, and I want to take this opportunity to help you to do that as well. So uh, first of all, if you have any questions, of course, please do pop them in. More than happy to answer any questions. Uh, as as they come in here, uh, so we're going to uh, we're going to go through a range of different things, as I say. So I'm going to now move on, and uh, I'm going to move on to sorry, my first slide there. Um, now there we go. So this is this is me. Um, this is me in action. A number of you asked me the last time, what is it exactly that I do? So part of the business 
that I have is a training business. So we provide training in entrepreneurship, economics, and the financial markets. And that's me in action right there. And an entrepreneur is going to be a, um, Uh, and uh, sorry, I just have to see a question there. Just somebody asked me, was I going to talk or are we going to uh, look at the book? Can I just check that everybody can hear me okay? Um, I'm just going to do a sound check there. I believe we should be okay. But I just want to check, can everybody hear me? Uh, yes, okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you indeed. Yeah, just just wanted to, to, to check in on that. Um, that's, that's great. Sorry, just when I saw quite a question like that. So what an entrepreneur does is somebody who takes on the risk of starting up something new and their intention is to de either deliver a product or a service in such a way where they can sell it at a higher price than the costs involved in, um, in, in, in buying it in, right? So in my case there, you see that day, that day I was actually in the local enterprise office in Offaly and I was delivering a training course that day on how, or I was delivering a, a session that day on how to start exporting. And um, our business exports into Malta, into the US, into the UK. And just this week, actually, we delivered for our first client in Dubai as well. So on that particular case, anyway, so that, that was what I was doing. So the costs involved in my business is obviously the, the time involved. And for me, who, when I'm delivering there, but also the time involved for preparing, as well as uh, I have a number, small number of staff as well. And we all, that obviously each person has a cost associated with them. We have training materials to print. We have marketing expenses and so on. And then, of course, the objective is, is that by the end of the week or by the end of the year is that you have generated a profit so that you can pay all your bills and also that you have some left over for yourself. And that is the risk for that is the payment for taking the risk. Now, an entrepreneur, of course, also I just put up the picture there of me in the context of the local enterprise office because it ties everything together that I'm doing tonight. But of course, a lot of people think an entrepreneur is somebody who, let's say, a Mark Zuckerberg type of person who starts a company like Facebook, gets huge investment, um, takes on a lot of money from investors and goes out and tries to build something that's going to take over the world. Of course, that's an entrepreneur as well. But so is your local doctor. So is your local chemist. So is your local shop. Uh, so are your online stores. So are a wide variety of companies. So an entrepreneur, we often think, you know, an entrepreneur is a person who goes on to try to make as much profit as possible. That's actually not the case. And any of you who are studying the new book will know that from the context of satisficing is that a lot of people are actually lifestyle entrepreneurs. Their job isn't, they, they don't seek out to make the most profit that they can, or as some of you will know, if you've studied the cost chapters, they're not seeking to make super normal profit. They're simply trying to make enough money so that they it is worth their while to pursue the business that they do and take on the risks that 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 they have. Just as a matter of interest, um, you might just chat in there into the into the questions pod. Are, do I have any any entrepreneurs, boating entrepreneurs, on the session tonight? So just I'd be interested to hear any any students or teachers, of course, anybody who is particularly interested in the context of this tonight from the context of being an entrepreneur yourself. Uh, okay, so okay, maybe in the future, um, yes. Okay, right, so I, I'm always interested in this because I think there's uh, often lots and lots of you who are really, um, really interested in, in this area. And particularly, of course, for any of you that are the Student Enterprise Awards run by the local enterprise board, or sorry, the local enterprise office are, are very helpful. Um, Cody says, I'd love to become an entrepreneur. Mary says, maybe someday. Garold says, yep, probably. Okay, that's that, That's great. Okay, so as, as we move on here now, I wanted to now move into the four factors of production. So took this straight out of the book. And as you can see here, in the case of Hillary's Deli, uh, those of you who are this far in the book will, will recognize her. So um, Hillary's Deli, she needs, she's an entrepreneur. She has decided to set up the deli. And... Uh, in the last book, of course, the other the other leaving certs, um, as as you'll, you'll recognise, we we moved from Pat, Pat we had Pat's Deli in the first book, and we moved it across to Hillary. Hillary was going to take over the world next. So there's four factors of production. Any time, any time at all, that you're going to have something of this nature, you're going to have land, labour, capital, and enterprise. Okay. So as you can see here, there in the case of Hillary, uh, we have that she has anything supplied by nature that helps in the production of wealth is land. So land isn't just actual, like a field, right? That's not, that's not what we're talking about. We're actually talking about 
things, right? So in my case, right, in, 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 in my own case, I do have an office, but it's an office where most people aren't who are in the business don't work in the office because they all work from home. Long before this COVID-19 business, long before um, we had people remote working. So therefore, we I wouldn't consider just the, our office being the only land that we that we have or, or that we need. But also, of course, like I showed you in that picture, is that we also that was taken and um, that was in the hotel in Tullamore. That was where I was delivering that for the local enterprise office in Offaly. So we also needed that land on that particular day. So anything supplied by nature that helps in the production is, is what we would consider land to be. Then we have labor. So that's where we have employees. So this is of course, where we have human activity directed towards the production of health. And in my own case, again, I have Caroline. She is my personal assistant. She organizes my diary. We also have Morris. He takes care of posting everything online and also in putting together our newsletters and a wide variety of other things. So that they would be, there would be the, the labor aspects of the business. And then we've capital. Now capital would be things. Um, they would be things like in Hillary's case, ovens, fridges, etc. In my case, sitting here talking to you tonight, it would be a laptop or it may be if I'm using a clicker for the laptop or for those of you studying accounting, it would be anything where the value of the asset is greater than a year. OK, so that would be capital. And then, of course, if we take if we take in Hillary's case, so we have she has an actual cafe. We also have staff. Right. So she has staff who are going to cook and serve customers. Customers. She's got fridges and ovens, but none of this is any good unless Hillary actually steps in here, decides, okay, we are going to sell X, Y, and Z products at such and such a price. They're going to be run at a profit, and I'm going to organize the staff, and I'm going to organize the capital, and I'm going to make sure that everything is working together so that when we open the doors of our shop, which is the land, as people walk in, they're going to be given a good customer experience. So enterprise is at the center, it is at the absolute center of the capital, uh, the, sorry, the borrowers of production. It's at the absolute center of it all. Now, I have to tell you, from my own personal point of view, right, there is nothing at all like being an entrepreneur. I love it, right? I, I absolutely love it. I would not choose anything else when I was a small girl, when I was back when I was three and four and five, literally, I'm telling you the truth here now. Um, I set up businesses in my imagination and my teddies were my clients and um, that was that was great, <laughs> and uh, because they never gave out, and um, my customer service department were was always very very quiet. So I had in back then I always find that if you want to find out what a what a person should really do with their career, look at what games they used to play as a child, and then you will get a lot of insight into what they really want to do later on when they're not influenced by job opportunities or CAO points, um, etc. etc. Now, uh, so when you take when when I after that I went on then and as I might have been telling you the last time I went on then and I studied uh, for my leaving cert got the points that I needed to go on and I studied financial maths and economics at college and it was actually only then it was 10 years ago this September we actually set up our first business and I have to say in my opinion there is absolutely nothing at all nothing at all like being in business for yourself um, there is nothing as risky, but there's also nothing as exciting, and it's 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 brilliant. I I do love it, and I would say that anybody who um wants huge variety in their day, be willing to work with a lot of different people in a lot of different parts of the country or parts of the world, and if you also want to be constantly learning and constantly challenged, then being an entrepreneur is 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 a great way to be. Now, it's also not for everyone. And uh, I would say that it is not the safest job in the world, particularly over the last while you'll have seen that. And it's also something that, as I mentioned, does require constant learning. You can never quite get just comfortable. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a, it's a very, very varied, 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 varied career. And particularly if you take on staff and even more so if you take on, um, if, you, if you start exporting as well. So I just now wanted to tell you about something that is very related to you guys, right? So I'm just gonna speak to the students now. So, and that is that um, the government does, the government is very, is very helpful uh, to businesses to grow, right? But they're not helpful to every business because there is, of course, the market economy. You, you guys all know this, right? There is demand, there is supply. There's only a certain amount the customers want. And of course, there's only a so certain amount the uh, suppliers are willing to supply. We match the two in the middle through price. If there's not enough goods, well, then the price goes up. If there's too much goods, then the price comes down, right? 
Now, the thing is, though, when you when you take that into consideration, um, there is a market economy out there, and that means that we do have a relatively efficient uh, allocation of goods and services across an economy. That's the whole idea of how it works. So what does the government support then? Well, what the government supports are three things, right? Number one are jobs. The more the government can enable people to take on people uh, in work, well, then it means that they don't have to pay them social welfare. And it also means that then they will be paying income tax on their wages. And of course, the other thing, the, the silent thing that's underneath that is as people are in jobs, they are trained. They're either trained how to do new things or else they're developing experience of doing the things they know how to do. And therefore, when they go on to do the next job, it's quite likely that they can charge more in their next job then. So therefore, by having people employed, you also have them in constant training. Now, that's number one. And that is, of course, it loops back to the wage subsidy scheme I mentioned tonight. The second thing that they're willing to support is export, without a shadow of a doubt, is export. And export is where you sell goods and services into different parts of the, of the world from Ireland. And that's obviously an Irish exporter. You would say the same for a different country. So let's let's take our business. So when we deliver training, let's say in Malta, uh, I go over to Malta, I deliver training there, particularly we, the Bank of Valletta is our customer over there. When we send the invoice, we bring that money back into Ireland. So that's new money coming into the country. So therefore, again, the government is willing to support that, right? The government will, will help companies to export. But the third one is innovation. And that's why I pulled up this slide here in front of you. Innovation is expensive, right? Nobody sat down one day and said, you know, what, so, you know what I really need right now, right? I really need a social media feed like Instagram. You know what? Nobody ever said, you know what? I really need something where we can upload videos of less than a minute and call it TikTok, right? Or nobody ever said, you know what we absolutely need right now is we need a way to be able to email, right? Nobody said that. All of these things happened over time. And for every Instagram, for every TikTok, for every email that, has, that is now today, in existence and successful, by God, I can tell you, there's a lot of them that aren't. There is an awful lot. There is a huge amount of failure that goes into innovation. And the reason for that is that if things haven't been done before, why haven't they been done before? Is it that something had been done before, it failed and therefore we don't know about it? Is it because it was too expensive? Is it for a variety of other reasons? However, we also know that innovation is what really pays. So a small percentage of innovation really works really well. And a lot of innovation isn't innovation per se, or it is, it's new ideas that don't succeed. And it's too expensive for a small business to take on the cost of innovation. It's just too expensive to do that sometimes. So the government steps in and does this, right? Now, here's where you come in. So we, we pursued this, this is an innovation partnership, right? And what happens here is this, our company applied for an innovation partnership and I'm jumping over months of a story here, right? But we, we, we got it approved. And here's the way it worked. We put in some money. Enterprise Ireland put in more money than us. And then in addition, we also agreed to put some work into this. So altogether, between what I'm telling you, this was uh, €125,000 between our company, Enterprise Ireland, and also some of our own work, right? Now, none of, that money didn't go into a pot. It went to a university. We then, the, all of that money went to Dublin City University and they employed a research assistant who had just finished their master's. And we, well, we had two over the full two year, that money was spent over two years. Over those two years, it cr created a job for somebody who had just finished a master's and another person who was just after finishing his PhD. And then they worked with us. Or we had an idea that we wanted to try out and uh, we built it and on and on and on it went from there. But the research assistants in the university were the people to actually explore the innovation. And then the risk was spread across the government, the government's money through Enterprise Ireland and all of those people who you see in front of you there uh, from the European Regional Development, uh, European Regional Development Fund and our money and our work. So now you see what happened is that as a result of this, the risk of the innovation was shared between the government and us. Similarly, we were encouraged from a government point of view to pursue a new idea. Two jobs were created. One, as I mentioned, for the guy who was just finished his PhD, the other guy from the master's. And then, uh, then when that came to an end, it finished last uh, October. Then what happens now is that we have a license to the innovation that was produced by the project. And then we pay that money back to the university and thus the government as, uh, as we build a business based on that innovation. So my point here is that this is a way in which the government does actually enable companies 
and entrepreneurship to thrive. That's the way that that's that's the way it, it works. Now, moving on from there, then uh, what I'm now going to do is I'm just going to quickly answer a quick question there. Uh, some people are asking if this is going to be able to, to be looked at afterwards. Absolutely. Uh, wholeheartedly, you can absolutely look at this afterwards. All of the but A, the recording will be available. And of course, B, the other thing that, that will be available is going to be a summary article as well, just like everything else on the Positive Economics blog. OK, uh, OK. Um, the live aspect obviously won't. So uh, please do stay tuned and uh, and we we'll, because we've lots to talk about yet. OK, so that is the way in which the government supports it. Now, you'll see this in a wide, a wide range of parts of the book where we talk about how government government supports affect entrepreneurship and how, how that, that has helped. So now let's move on to a research inquiry. Let's now in, interrogate entrepreneurship in Ireland, right? Let's now just really consider how does this work? So here, as you can see, the research inquiry, these are the six steps that you will need to follow. So for those of you who are in uh, fifth year, this is what you're going to have to do. Uh, when it comes to you, produ you producing your research um, report for next year, is first the thing you need to do is to choose an individual line of inquiry relating to your chosen research topic. Now, um, you will be given a broad research topic by the um, by the government. The Department of Education will give this to you. I have seen some examples of, of what they will be, and I will take you through those in upcoming webinars. So first of all, as I say, we choose an individual line of inquiry. Then the second thing you need to do is find reliable data. And I'm going to show you some examples of good solid data when it comes to entrepreneurship this evening. The third thing is what relevant economic concept are you going to have to apply because it also has to tie back into the Leaving Cert course. Then you're going to have to look into the sources of information and then you're going to have to make conclusions out of that. And then finally, you can reflect on new knowledge, understanding and skills learned and how your thinking has changed. Right. So I'm going to take you through very exactly the six steps. Just like I, I told you on our last webinar, we do have a booklet thing that we're putting that we're putting together. Uh, where we, it's, it's actually almost gone to the printers at this stage because we have to do some, make some edits based on the announcement. So we're we're um I, I was telling you about that last month for those of you who are interested. So we're well advanced now in that uh, at, the, at this stage. Okay, so now as we move on, let's now just think about uh, entrepreneurship and let's think about where do we get the data, right? So where do we get the data now? The principal source of really good data when it comes to enterprise is the GEM, the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. That's really the principal, principal source of where you can get a, a huge amount of entrepreneurship data in the context of looking at what economists want to find. But here's a problem. Does anyone spot the problem? What happened here was I went on to the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor site. Uh, I went over to, uh, to the national reports. I searched for Ireland and look at the latest one, GEM Ireland 2018. This is going to be your challenge as economists is that sometimes we can actually only find data uh, whereby the data is, is not very much up to date. Like I was going to take you through a couple of sources of data tonight, which I looked at at the last time that they were updated and they're just out, too far out of date for all of what's going on at the moment in Ireland, it just it it just it just was too far back. So I didn't want to let that happen, and instead I said, okay, I'm going to going to stick with with what I know, um, and you're going to have that challenge too, and you're going to have to understand or maybe to identify the difference between what if I have older data that's very very good in comparison to newer data that's lesser reliable. Okay, so that that is going to be that is that is going to be a challenge that you have, but. The, the key purpose of your research report isn't necessarily just relying on the data that you have, but the conclusions that you make. So you'll see how, how I negotiate that process this evening. The state of play with Irish entrepreneurship today. Okay. This is arising from that 2018 report. Look at, I like the number that jumps out to me here is that 2,250 businesses started per month in 2018 right so over 2,000 potential employers for every single one of you tuning in here tonight who is a student that is the amount of businesses that started that started in ireland in 2018 so overall it was 26,900. okay so over the full the full length of time 26,900 businesses opened up in, in 2018 but look over there on the right hand side and that's really i think the a really strong research inquiry question we could ask is okay 
But how many of these are going to become employers? Because if these individual businesses are a lot of people become self-employed, that's great, that's super. They'll generate revenue. They will be able to pay tax on that revenue. They won't be taking social welfare. All of that's great. But what about you guys who don't want to become entrepreneurs? What about you guys who actually want to go on and you guys want to work in these companies? Well, if you look over there on the right-hand side, look at the jobs impact. 84% of Irish businesses is an employer now or will be within five years of starting. So therefore, for any of you even in fifth year or leaving cert, by the time that you would leave school, sorry, not school, but let's say that you decide to go on and that you go on to uh, study for a four-year degree or you take uh, an apprenticeship. Well, an apprenticeship is different because you're, you're working and studying at the same time. But the point is that 84% of these businesses today expect to be in employers. And also, if you look at the jobs expectation underneath that, you can see 25% expect to have 10 plus jobs in five years and to increase their jobs by 50%. So now you now we're starting to see a picture forming here, right? Now we're starting to understand, okay, the more businesses that start, that's a good thing. But if we can see that these companies have, have employment expectations, well, now that's an even better thing for people who want to find jobs in the future, for the economy in the future, for government revenue in the future, etc. Now, just for a moment, let's also consider the point I made to you about exporting. When you think about exporting, just go down there to the international orientation. Look at those. Let's now let's now just just consider the types of companies, the new companies that that are here. Is that it says thirty one percent of these new companies are born global. In other words, more than twenty five percent of their revenue comes, uh, is overseas. Now our company was in is in that bracket today. Um, we started the business in September, and by May of 2011, so we started in September 2010, by May of 2011, we had our first client abroad. So I'm not quite sure that we were born global, and certainly it was not from 20%, 25% of our revenue. That took a lot of time to, to build up. Um, but 72% of these new companies have international customers of any description of the revenue from overseas. Now, what, what does that tell you? Well, number one, it tells you that they're increasing the amount of sales coming into the country for those of you that have studied the international trade chapter you know those companies are helping the balance of trade you know that they're helping the balance of trade of, of, of balance of payments you also know that they are now going to be suitable for government support because the government wants to encourage these companies to grow and then it's also interesting to see well what where will these companies be employing people because if I'm just going to say, let's say that we dramatically grow our business in Malta. Well, then probably what we would need to do is to take on a trainer or some other staff in Malta, as opposed to me going out and coming back. But you see, you see here when you start looking at information, then then you can get lost. Right? Then you say, OK, you know, we could start. We could, we could look at some of these here. We could dig down. And that's what you're going to have to avoid in the research study. You have to stay focused. You have to have to stay focused because the research study, I don't know if you're aware of this yet, but uh, it has to be a maximum of 1,500 words. That's all. 1,500 words is going to be the maximum amount of, of words you can put into your research study report. So it's really important, really, really important that as a result of that, that you stay focused on your research. Okay. Now, uh, so what I'm going to do is do just that. Uh, I'm now going to stay very, very focused on, the, I'm solely going to look at the relationship between the number of companies that are starting up and the size of, of entrepreneurship in Ireland and employment. That's going to be my focus, my razor, razor sharp. And when I look at that, then I then went and then I found another reliable source of data. And this is from the Oireachtas. I found the Shannon Public Consultation Committee report on small and medium-sized businesses in Ireland in 2019. You might say, okay, Susan, like how am I supposed to know where every single report under the sun is going to be for all these things? Don't worry about that, honestly. Things, because of that super thing with all the internet, you, all you need to do is Google for, your, for your, um, your research study and then you'll find things quite quickly. But what's important here is that the information is reliable. So if it's come from the Oireachtas, that's reliable. If it's come from the Global Entrepreneurship Report, that's reliable. If it's come from the CSO, Central Statistics Office, that's reliable. If it's come from the Department of Jobs, Business, Employment and Innovation, that's reliable. If it's come from Enterprise Ireland, that's reliable. If it's some random article that you just stumbled across and has a load of clickbait on it, yeah, that's probably not. 
if the, you need to make sure, and, and this is this will be examined within your report, is have you used reliable data? Now, so of course we know that uh, based on what I'm what I'm talking about here, uh, we do know that the uh, the Shannon Public Consultation Committee report here that this is something that I can use and look at the key thing, right? Um, look at the look at the, the information that, that I've got here, and that is that the SME sector accounts for 99.8% of total active enterprises, right? So that means that only 0.2% of all the businesses in the country only account, um, only uh, for, uh, sorry, for every business in the country, except for 0.2% are SMEs, are small and medium enterprises. Now, also the SME, and this is the key, this is the key number that I need to get to, is that 65% uh, of all employees are employed by SMEs. That's my figure. This is my golden figure. This is what I wanted. I wanted to know, okay, what percentage of employment is responsible or is facilitated by entrepreneurship? And now I know, now I know that the answer to that is 65%. And that is that that is that is what's 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 important here. Now I also know on the bottom there I can see um, that of all exports, the thirty-one percent of all exports is contributed to. Uh, thank, sorry, I'm just going to stop here for a moment because you, you you've started to ask me some really really good stuff, really good stuff here. Uh, Ross just asked me what is an SME. An SME is a small and to medium enterprise. Okay, it's a small to medium enterprise. That that's what it is. Um, then in uh, Neil asked, is the information classified as primary or secondary source? Neil, this is secondary because I'm getting it secondhand, right? In other words, the CSO put this together and I'm access, or sorry, uh, in this case was the Shannon Public Consultation Committee report. Since that was put together by them and I've accessed that, that's secondhand. Primary would be if I went and I interviewed people myself and I gathered and, and I gathered these, these facts together. Um, right. <laughs> so Lana asked me a great question. Um, are you going to do more online classes for the 2021 Leaving Cert people in relation to the project? Absolutely, I will, Lana. I'm going nowhere. Yeah, you and me together here. Don't worry. I'll be with you all the way. Um, she, uh, she says, I personally would find it very helpful. Thank you for answering if you do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kira says, do you know when students in fifth year will receive the topic of the research project? Kira, I have, uh, I believe it will be um, in the very early part of your new academic year, so early September. Um, ben asks me, do you reckon the COVID-19 crisis will greatly affect these figures for 2020, 21, 22? Ben, I'm going to answer that very clearly for you at the latter part of the session. So. I really appreciate that you asked the question and you're already thinking ahead. So I will answer you for sure. Chris, uh, excellent question, Chris. Guys, you're you're absolutely spot on with these questions. Keep them coming, you're brilliant. Um, Chris asks an excellent question. Why is there always so much about multinationals in the media? Chris, I'll tell you why, right? Um, I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. Number one is that if I took on, right, let's say you came to join my company today and let's say Lana joins somebody else's company tomorrow and let's say Kira joins somebody else's company the day after, you're not going to see a headline around like, Hayes Cullet and Limited takes on one extra person today. It's just not media, you know, it's, 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 there's not enough of a story. Whereas if Intel announces 500 new jobs, it's worthwhile actually telling that story because it's, it's going to have a bigger impact. So that's one of the reasons. The second reason is, of course, is uh, because they have a, a, huge, a huge impact on the salary size. Um, of, now, roundabout uh, for, uh, foreign direct investment is, is responsible for, based on the last figure that I have, is about eight uh, percent of employment, but the average salary level of those employment of that employment level would be higher, um, and and a range of, of other reasons. Ronan says, are newspaper articles either online or actual newspapers considered reliable? Ronan, to be honest, it depends on the paper, right? If you have a broadsheet, yes, right. If it's going to come from the Irish Times or it's going to come from the New York Times, yes, uh, that would be considered considered reliable. Um, and I am. Um, Okay, Ross, you're the only one I'm going to do this for. Ross says, could you please give a shout out to Mr. Aidan Douglas so that my teacher knows that I'm listening? <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to, going to get back over here. I'm going to get, get back, onto the, back onto the content. 
keep the questions coming. I will answer as many as I can. By the way, I also will make sure that we're we're finished by by eight pm as well this evening. So keep the questions coming, and, and I'll answer as as much as I can. So here's my focus. My focus is what's the relationship between um between entrepreneurship and employment? And there you go. There I have it. Sixty five percent is was the magic figure that I was looking for. Okay, right. So now that we know that, let's now move forward and. I just, here's where I want to give you the answer, right? To, to the question that I put to you earlier around business failure, right? I'm just gonna, just gonna uh, remind you of what you said. So what you said was that 37% of, uh, of you, 37% of you said that you felt the main reason that businesses in Ireland, uh, oh, sorry, the question was structured incorrectly. Do you think the main reason that business in Ireland closed was what I had meant to say was because they're not making enough profit um, because they can find a better opportunity elsewhere because of family reasons or issues getting access to finance. Uh, so actually, the, 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 the answer is here. And that is that uh, in Ireland, it's the biggest reason is for family reasons is businesses close because of work life balance. And we're the highest number in Europe as a result of that. And um, I am just going to and uh, just going to show you where you can see that you see that see that right here is that uh, due to family reasons, 32% of Irish of people who close businesses do so for family reasons and we're the highest in Europe uh with the highest in Europe in Europe for that the next reason is because business wasn't profitable is for 22 percent of people who close businesses are because it's not profitable it's actually only one in five businesses that close close because they can't actually generate enough profit and um, the next issue then is problems uh getting finance so that's 14 percent and then also because some people get offered a better opportunity however look over the very very left hand side right i'm just going to point right over here okay if you look over here is that actually the percentage of businesses that close or that discontinue in ireland is 1.9 percent that's all right and and when i say that's all um that would mean that for every 100 businesses in ireland today well in 2018 for every 100 businesses in ireland in 2018 and 98 of them were still in operation by the end of the year which is which is quite like it's, it's considerably healthy and also, if you look down here, you can also see over here, right? So you can also see um, right over here then that we are round about the middle um, the middle of the, the road in terms of that in Europe. So uh, in Austria, it's three and a half percent of businesses. And of course, interestingly, Austria was the first country last week to open up um, some shops. And as you can see, Switzerland has the lowest rate of business exit at one percent. So let's now consider before I move move on to the the economic output, uh, can economic impact of, of COVID nineteen. Let let's just just briefly here. I'm just going to erase those. Okay, I'm just going to erase all those those drawings, and I'm going to go back on my mouse. Right. So let's just for a moment now. Let's just go back up to here. So our the individual line of inquiry that I wanted to consider was I wanted to consider what was the relationship between enterprise of uh, entrepreneurship in Ireland, which is small to medium enterprises and how that relates to employment. I got my relevant and reliable data. I got them from two sources. One was the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor and the second one was the paper from the Oireachtas. My specific economic um, the, the concept was the four factors of production, which are land, labor, capital and enterprise. And even further than that, what is the demand for labor as a result of the presence of entrepreneurship? So when I analyze the information, I realized that uh, number one, is that new businesses are, that I have uh, 2,250 new businesses opening per month. And of those 84% is now an employer or starting to employ within five years. And overall the SME sector accounts for 65% of total employees. And that the business exit ratio or percentage is at 1.9%. And predominantly that is done because of family reasons um, as opposed to one in five businesses close because they can't make enough enough profit so they're my conclusions and the last thing i need to be thinking about is what so what what now is my new knowledge understanding and skills learned and how thinking would have changed so there i would say okay well i now have learned more about where i get my information i have learned what the connection is between my subjects that i wanted to look for which is entrepreneurship and, and employment I've also learned that i've also now understood that the reason companies close is different to what i thought I now have found skills in research. I am now more up to date or I'm now more updated on the real um, entrepreneurship landscape in Ireland, particularly if I want to be an entrepreneur myself. 
And finally, I'm also aware that there are a number of ways that governments will support um, entrepreneurship in Ireland. And one example of that is an innovation partnership. That might be of interest to me if I set up a business and I want to pursue an innovative idea myself in the future, or I may well decide to work as a research assistant with a university for a company to investigate innovation. And that would be a really interesting job. There you go. There's my research inquiry. So um, before I go back over to the questions, I now just want to, to spend one slide, right? One slide on COVID-19. And then I will answer as many questions as you can throw at me. What is this? This was published yesterday, right? This was under the SPU, and that is the Stability Program Update. Now, I don't want to bamboozle you with all sorts of acronyms and websites and everything else. That's why I'm here, and that's why I will be here again with you next month. And by the way, guys, I will be with you in June, and I will be with you in July, right? I will be, as long as the school year in this year dawdles on, I will be with you. There will be a webinar every month until your leaving cert is done. And if it happens that uh, your leaving cert is in August, um, I, I, I don't want to be adding to the speculation, but obviously um, your minister, Joe McHugh, has added a lot more clarity on the potential date that was that was uh, discussed over the last 24 hours. So if your leaving cert is in August, I will be with you again in August. We'll do another webinar in August. And then, of course, for the fifth years who will be leaving certs, we'll start again in September. As long as you're in school, I'm going to be here with you. OK, so. In each webinar, I will make sure that I will get the information for you and where you will have the sources so you can keep up to date yourself on individual elements. And then next month, we'll start it all again and we'll, we'll keep you updated all the way. Here's the key things that you need to know regarding COVID-19. And now, not this time, just in terms of employment, but in terms of the economy. And that is Irish GDP is set to fall by 10.5% this year. Now, if I was in a room with you all, I would be asking you, what is what do we call a... Uh, what, what do we call it when GDP falls by greater than 10%? And of course, some of you would tell me that uh, the answer to that is a depression. And a depression is when you have a fall of 10% uh, on, on any, at any given stage. Okay, A recession, or I, you probably know this already, but a recession are two consecutive declines in economic growth. But if there is a sharp fall of 10%, um, then that's called a depression. Now, Ben, this goes back to your question about do I expect things to change as a result of COVID-19, particularly in terms of environment? Here's your answer. There, actually, I got the answer directly from Pascal Donahue himself, which is that the labour market bears the brunt of the economic shock, going from full employment to peak unemployment rate at 22% in the current quarter. Like, in the current quarter. This is unheard of, guys. It's unheard of to go from tickety-boo and where you have got full employment within the same quarter of where you could then be at an unemployment rate of 22%. So that is for every 100 people available for work, 22% of them would be unemployed. Now, I don't want you to be worrying too much about that figure, right? As in, from your own point of view, you're a long way from being in full-time employment yourselves. I understand that some of you may be in households where you've had one parent or two parents or brothers or sisters who found unemployment. The key, the key thing here is that we will see that that number change, right? We will see we will see that number change, and the wave the wave subsidy, um, the, the the wave subsidy scheme is doing a huge amount in order to prevent that from happening. Now, then then they said the recovery over the second half rests on successful virus containment, and of course this is all about the, the flattening the curve, and Dr. Tony Holan is now saying that. Um, that there hasn't been a, that there hasn't been a, a first wave really because it has been flattened so much. That is because everybody, including you, have done so much uh, to, to to do that. So we have to keep going with the social distancing, with staying at home, um, with all of those sorts of things, and of course as well with, with washing our hands in order to facilitate that. Now, GGD, um, like without getting into all sorts of details here. This basically, that 23 billion, that basically means that this year the government is expecting to spend 23 billion more than it expects to take in in tax. So what that means is that for every 100 euro that the government will spend is that it's likely to only take in um, 77 euro in tax. Um, and that's hefty, all right, that is significant. But on the other hand, um, it can borrow at very, very, very low interest rates from investors through the bond market or through uh, monetary policy as well from the European Central Bank to, to get us through that. Now, uh, modified domestic demand, again, like if we, if we cut through the jargon here, 
uh, what that really means is when you take into consideration primarily i'm leaving out a few because they're I, I don't want to get into the nitty-gritty of it but domestic demand means what you and me spend as individuals and also what the government spends um so when when you take when you add those two together that is what the domestic demand is like that that's what domestic demand is made up of it's a little bit to do with, with companies and stuff as well but primarily what what you and me you you and me spend as well as the government that's projected to fall by 15 percent. in other words that for every 100 euro that you and me might have spent uh, we now may be spending only 85 euro and as i told you about on the last webinar partly that's because we we may have less money but also it's because of course we're now we can spend it in as much like i can go out for coffee and take my husband out to lunch for example um on on a given day now because coffee shops aren't open so so that's for two reasons both demand and supply now this is the part that's really positive if if we can continue flattening the curve and if we can get people back to work is that we could actually um particularly in the second half of the year to gain momentum for next year like economic growth of six percent next year would be phenomenal and you could see a huge increase again in employment and prospects and everything and for those of you who are going on to into third level or an apprenticeship or you're going to or whatever you might be doing after you're leaving cert um, hopefully you'll be shielded from from a lot of this and therefore by the time that you come out all will be well and of course similarly for those of you who are doing fifth year next year will when you'll be doing your projects and in fact this could be part of it and then we are looking to see employment to go again in 2021 with the numbers out of work to fall below 10 percent and look we'll see from there we'll, we'll see we'll see from there so that brings to an end um the parts that i had wanted to talk about with everybody so I just wanted to mention two things. One, on the left-hand side is the blog. Um, that's If you go to positiveeconomics.ie and click on the blog, you will see the recording from last week, last month's webinar where I focused on COVID-19 and the gender pay gap. The month before when I focused on exports, the month before that when I focused on housing and uh, and also all of the, the others before. And on the right-hand side, um, please feel free to connect with me on Instagram. I'm at Susan, uh, the Positive Economist. Um, I by the way I've, i'm posting a lot more than i used to in the past so don't worry that four posts will increase dramatically between now and and the next time so so please do please do um you can feel free to, to check in with me there and if you want to send me a message please do as well right so let's take a look at your questions now what have you guys have been saying uh okay loads here which is brilliant um right uh let me let me take it there from the start okay now interesting yeah interesting james asks Highly relevant question here. Uh, how do they release such definite figures when nobody can yet project if the recession will be V, U or L shaped? Okay, so a V shaped um, dip, we'll say, is when it dips. So if you spend, um, or if, if the economy drops by that 10%, right, and then straight away goes right back up again, that's called a V shaped. If the economy falls, and then it stays slow, right? So if economic growth is, is actually negative and for a while and then it increases, then that would be a U-shape and then L-shape is when it falls and it does, doesn't recover. James, it's I have to say, and this is the challenge of being an economist, right? Is that the, in it's not that they have definite figures, right? What, what, what they've, what I've showed you there, the report that was issued yesterday, it's, it's too hard. Like it's actually too hard to to call in terms of what it'll what it'll be there's so many variables in this equation yet but the reason that they put numbers on things is so that we can actually work around them is that the government now can put in place a strategy to say right look what what are we going to do after the 12 weeks when we have the wage subsidy scheme what happens then right and that is a challenge that is that is a really really big challenge because they need to figure this out they need to like a month ago sorry, today, a month later, we know an awful lot more than we did a month ago. So it's not that they're putting definite figures and saying this is what will happen. They're saying using their best estimates, that's, that's, that's what they, that's what, what, they, what they, they know now. Um, Cody asks, uh, would it be safer to have any successful mentor if you want to become an entrepreneur or should you look for a mentor that could become a future competition? Do you have a mentor? Yeah, it's good. It's a good question, Cody. And I'm going to link that back into the context of the webinar this evening. And that is that Enterprise Ireland and the local enterprise offices do provide funding for the like of my business to find a mentor, right? And they will they will find them and they will also pay them, right? Or else they'll part pay them. One of the things, and I, then I'll get back to your question about, about competition and so on, but one of the things that, that the government announced 
Uh, and I mentioned this very briefly with you at the last webinar, but the, the detail hadn't been fleshed out, so I, I couldn't elaborate. The business continuity voucher, right? The business continuity voucher is now a two and a half thousand euro voucher that the local enterprise office has made available to businesses like mine and where we can go to a consultant and spend that two and a half thousand euros to talk about how do we change what we're doing as a business to be able to continue in business. So in our case, uh, a lot of our in-person training just dissolved. Uh, any bookings that we had for three months dried up. That obviously had an impact on the business. We had to scale up dramatically online. We had to increase our ability to deliver um, economic consultancy. I told you about the new client that we got in Dubai. We, um, at the moment, I'm, I'll give you an example, tomorrow night, I'm a lecturer as well for Ulster University. And tomorrow night, I have to run my first ever completely online test. I don't know if you saw the news today about, you know, a discussion around whether that would work for you in the Leaving Cert. Um, but in my case, I had to design that um, for the university. And I now have to show other people in the university how I'm doing so so that they can learn from, from our lessons. All of that would be around business continuity. So we could go to a consultant and to, to say to them, okay, how do we scale online? Now, gratefully, we had a lot of capability in order to do that, but that is that is the type of government support structure that's actually, Cody, out there right now. So then, he, do I have a mentor? Absolutely, I always have, uh, and I have more than one, but um, I have one in particular that I turn to um, all the time, and that person has been absolutely and utterly incredibly helpful and yes, you are right. Some mentors could turn them into your competition, so you have to be careful around that. But um, I, I could talk about that forever, Cody. And, and I, you know, on another on another time, I might. But what what I will say is that it's there's certainly ways to find mentors where, where they, they they won't compete. Um. Okay. So then, Eamon asks a question regarding the stock market. What do you see as being profitable areas and products post COVID nineteen? Yeah, very very good question. And by the way, a number of you have asked me uh, tonight around the stock market right here here's what here's what i'd say all right number one is really important when you're thinking about the stock market to be considerate of investing in that trading right it's not about you know trying to make a quick buck buying something and seeing it go up 10 percent, and then you know seeing it fall again tomorrow i know that's the way the stock market has been for the last month it's not always like that i have been buying buying shares over the past while i've been drip feeding my money in i've been buying companies that are at a much they're they're offering a lot of value and how i measure value is possibly by their dividend yield or by their price earnings ratio all of those um ratios that all of you who study accounting know all about and and i have been i've been you know drip feeding drip feeding my way in there but i'm not trying to buy today and sell in a month's time i am looking to sell within the next four to five years and constantly then you know moving forward i've been investing in the stock market since or the last 15 years i'd say so it's an area that i'm that i'm quite familiar with but all i will say on that is um is number one is look for value uh Eamon and everybody else asking number two is ask yourself would you be willing to hold the stock for a good period of time and uh, and number three i would also say is drip feed your money don't be backing horses hoping that something will rise quickly and, and fall so when you say what are the most profitable areas and products um the most, the, the most, the shares that are likely to do best are going to be the ones that offer good value, like high dividend yields or, you know, a good business models with low PE ratios. In terms of products, um, obviously, I mean, I'm stating the absolute obvious here, right? But the obvious thing to say here is obviously the 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 pharmaceutical that comes up with the vaccine like is going to do amazingly well. But anything, I would say that the key differentiator between business survival and continuity and thus thrival at the moment are companies uh, that have got a good, strong ability to be able to um, work online, whether it is e-commerce, whether it is having people who can work remotely, whether it is people who deliver software as a service, and those those types of things uh, are going to are likely to do very well. But also, you've also got like, what do we need to survive? We need food, you know, we need food, so food and um, and companies of that nature, we need banks and financial services companies, so all of those defensive types of companies, if you can find those at good value, then uh, then you're, you're then that, that's that's likely to go well as well. Okay, um, then uh, let me see now. So Scott says, will multinationals play a vital part in Ireland's economic recovery? Scott, we all will. We all will. Every one of us. We all will play a vital part. Yes, of course, multinationals will as well. Look, they're responsible, as I mentioned, for eight percent of employment. They're responsible for a very significant amount of tax. Um, and I'm not going to get into this corporation tax issue. I think that's that's partly missing the point, really. I mean, they're when they when they put money into a country, 
and they employ people in a country, then there's income tax from that, there's VAT from that. There's also a wide variety of other things um, arising from that as well, like the knock-on effects. Like we sell into multinationals and then we pay tax on the, the on our corporation tax, obviously we pay tax on our, um, on our incomes, but also our staff pay tax on that and so on. So yes, they will play, but Scott, everyone will. SMEs will, the government will, students today will. And guys, we need you to stay focused on what you're doing right now so that as a result, um, that, that you're able and willing to go and to be able to do the Leaving Cert to the, to the best of your ability so that you can give yourselves the best prospects to go on into, into the next stage of your own journeys and start your careers. Um, I'm going to take one more. I could go on here all night, I really could. And you're brilliant. I love all the questions, I really do. Uh, so the, um, the James says here, uh, do you, uh, sorry, he says, is individual line of inquiry a question or is it a statement of your goals? It is a question, James. So a uh, line of inquiry is what is the relationship between um, employment and enterprise, for example? Uh, or it could also be stated as a question that's stated in a, in a, in a sentence. In other words, um, the research question that I seek to answer is what is the relationship between between the two? But it is like, in essence, you are researching a line of inquiry. It, it can't be, uh, you know, even if you say an analysis of the relationship between, it's still investigating something. So it is, you are seeking to answer a question that that is that is ultimately what, what, what you're there for. Okay, well, in the interest of being on time, I really wanted uh, to make sure that that I um, that I delivered this on time and on point for you. I'm so appreciative to everybody that joined. As I mentioned, feel free to, to follow me there on Instagram. I'm on Twitter as well, Susan Hayes underscore. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm everywhere. Um, but uh, the one place you can be sure that I will be is back here with you again next month. And uh, and we'll 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 uh, of course we will let you know through the um we'll we'll let you know through. Edco uh, Digital, of course, Edco will email you or if you're on our own mailing list at positiveeconomist.com, well, then we will also send you one. And uh, to uh, Quileen Barry, uh, oh, <laughs> um, I also, so uh, she said, thanks so much, Susan, for this. Please give me a shout out. Last word to you then in, in that case. And uh, really appreciate everyone's time. Every best wish to you all. The recording is going to be available with an article afterwards. And we will uh, see you all again soon. Thank you and good night. Thank <laughs> you.